and this really now brings it to the cancer field and other fields too but let's just focus on cancer on the top panel here you see a diagram of two neighboring bilayers of cells the connections the six hexamers or semi channels hemi channels somehow magically we don't know how this is done aligns with the heme channel of the neighboring cell forming now a complete channel through which ions and small molecules below a thousand daltons can freely flow back and forth now it turns out we took several molecules that we knew were tumor promoters uh, one is one methyl anthracene which is the most predominant molecule whenever you smoke a cigarette or eat a uh, grilled steak whenever you pyrolyze plant proteins you form one methyl anthracene now when you put just the vehicle control on your control cells and scrape you can see the cells are communicating beautifully if you put a non-cytotoxic, a non-mutagenic concentration of 1-methyl anthracene on these cells, you can see after five minutes, they don't communicate. You can remove the 1-methyl anthracene, and within six or eight hours, they are re-communicating just like the control. In other words, it doesn't kill cells, it doesn't mutate cells, it just blocks communication and therefore blocks the signal that are going through cells. But over time, if we, you know, keep it being exposed to disrupting that communication at the gap junctions, that's when we enter the that's problems. Right. That's exactly right. Okay. And the second concept you have to realize with regard to molecules that modulate gap junctions. When I use the word modulate, I mean you can either decrease communication, which is usually a bad thing, or you can increase communication, which I'll show in a few moments, which in most cases can be a good thing. All right. But the concept that is illustrated with this series of slides, or that this series, is that there's a threshold level by which epigenetic compounds can block gap junction. Below that level, it doesn't do a damn thing. Above that level, <laughs> you now see, for example, TPA, which is a molecule from a croton plant that's a powerful skin tumor promoter. It blocks communication. When you don't put any TPA on these cells, they communicate beautifully. When you increase the communication, where the cells don't die and it doesn't mutate cells, but it blocks the communication in a dose-dependent fashion, and that's when the cells start to proliferate. Because when they're communicating via gap junctions, they don't communicate. They're contact inhibited. When you block that communication, they're free. They're free to go and free to proliferate, <laughs> all right? And this now comes back to the stem cells and gap junctions. This is the one that unifies these two and convinced me you can forget about all of the other genes. Oh, yeah, they're important, but not like gap junctions and OC4A. Here you're looking again at a clone that was derived by symmetrical cell division of the type 1 cell. And when you do the scrape loading technique, you see at five minutes later, there's no communication. There's no gap junctions through which the lucifer yellow can transfer. On the other hand, when you induce these cells to differentiate, which takes place about, oh, maybe 72 hours, you can see that now they obviously are able to transfer the lucifer yellow and therefore gap junctions must be present. When we study 
to see whether they had OCK4. They had OCK4 when we studied these cells for the connections. They didn't have connections. On the other hand, when you study for OCK4 in these differentiated mammary epithelial cells, uh, no OCK4 was shown, and of course, gap junctions are shown. So the lesson to be learned here is that there's a correlation between the cell's inability to communicate when they're expressing OCK4 but not expressing connexins. But here, when they are differentiated, the cells are no longer expressing OCK4 but expressing connexins. And this proves, without a shadow of a doubt, that those type 1 cells that we had isolated, that we showed that didn't have any gap junctions, but had OCK4, are the stem cells. You look at any medical textbook and you find a histological picture, such as the one you see on the left, of an architecture found in the human breast tissue. You see the duct, you see the branches, and you see the uh, nodules, or yeah, the nodules that are formed. If you now take a pure culture of the type 1 cells that don't have gap junctions, but OCK4 is present, and you take a pure culture of the mammary epithelial differentiated cells that were derived from those stem cells, disassociate both of those cells and now mix them on matrigel, and within 24 hours, Within 24 hours, amazingly, these cells crawl together to form this architecture that's got now the beginnings of the architecture of a normal human breast tissue. This now shows, after six weeks, that strange 24-hour architecture is converted to a three-dimensional breast organoid, human breast organoid. You see the ductal three-dimensional image, you see the branch points, and you see these budding areas. And it turns out all three, these branch sites were where the stem cells were, and this is where you find the concentrated stem cells and this is also where you find the human breast cancers usually starting from. So here we're making and made, and this is done in 1995. We showed the people at the University of Michigan and they never acknowledged us. We tried to submit it to all of the major journals, Cell, PNAS, science, nature, they all rejected it. They said, this is crazy. This was 1995, after we had already shown in 1985 that we had isolated kidney stem cells and could make kidney. Well, to make a long story short, if we go to the next slide, this now proves once and for all directly that Normal human organ specific stem cell, in this case breast stem cells, give rise to the highly tumorigenic cancer stem cell. And here, here we go. We've isolated these pure type 1 breast stem cells, and then we made an antibody to OCK4A, reacted this fluorescent antibody to the stem cells, and you see all the stem cells are expressing OCK4A antibody, fluorescent. If you now differentiate these type 1 cells uh, within 72 hours or even before, now react it to the fluorescent OCK4A antibody, and you don't see any expression in any of the differentiated cells. If you now expose these type 1 cells, if we add SV40 virus, if you add human papillomavirus, or even the hepatitis virus, 
to these type 1 cells, you will isolate immortalized cells. They no longer can divide asymmetrically. And when we react the fluorescent oct for a antibody to it, you can see all the nuclei are expressing in these immortalized but not cancer cells OC4A, just like the stem cell. On the other hand, if you add these viruses to the differentiated mammary epithelial cell, this SV40, HPV, human hepatitis X gene, nothing. You never get any immortal cell that survives. On the other hand, if you take these non-cancerous immortal cells and x-ray them, you'll find colonies that now are weakly tumorigenic when you put them back into the mouse. And it turns out, reacting it with the OC4A antibody, you see they still are expressing OC4A. Then when you genetically engineer these with the ERB2 or the new oncogene, which is frequently found in human breast cancer, you end up with highly tumorigenic uh, breast cancer stem cells. And you can see the OC4 fluorescent antibody is found in all the nuclei. So this tells you since all of these cells were clonally derived from a single cell, that the only cell that gave rise to these highly tumorigenic breast cancer stem cells were those that originally were expressing the OC4A. And uh, that pretty much proved to us that, in fact, the cancer stem cell has to derive from the normal organ-specific stem cell, not by reprogramming a totally differentiated epithelial cell. So sure. here, here, if you don't mind me asking, sure. when we look at these, when we look at these images, we, we, we see that yeah, OCT4 is being expressed very differently across the images. And um we do see some i'm in the mature type 2 cells we do see some oct4 expression it's minimal right very right. minimal uh, so what was when you started to look at this it, it, it's very different how oct4 is being expressed as we go along and i'm sure conclusions were made on this and maybe i jumped the gun again on why these the, the expression was so different as we went along cuz even see some cells express it even more in the immortal. Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. The interesting point, you know, I'm not a uh, microscopist, if you want to call me that. If you look at the antibody, they're punctated. This tells you, and they're on obviously different chromosomes. That tells you that yeah. for a protein, a transcription factor, has been bound to the different chromosomes at different regions. It's it, it's mind-boggling. The the man who studied OC4 originally, he's a German, he didn't believe us because his antibody doesn't do this. In other words, he didn't have the antibody we had. And this really shows that that protein which is a you know a transcription factor it's it's a small amount of protein but it was bound to obviously different chromosomes i wish we could go to the next level because i didn't have the technology if you could somehow isolate the chromosomes from those cells and to look at where the oc4 actually bound I mean, you could do that on molecular, uh, but on the chromosome level, uh, it hasn't been done. All right. Now we're going to illustrate how the concept of cell communication, stem cells, 
and epigenetic phase of epigenetic mechanisms fit into the initiation promotion progression stage of carcinogenesis. And here, what I'm about to show you are the two conceptual slides to put all of this together. In every one of our organs, we have a small collection of stem cells in our eye, our brain, our lung, our kidney, wherever, and they're constantly being exposed to agents that can either damage the DNA, such as ultraviolet light in the skin cells of our body, and most of us can repair that damage, but a xeroderma pigmentosum patient cannot and will convert that lesion in the DNA to a mutation. And if it occurs in one of those 100, 150 so-called cancer-related genes, the oncogenes, tumor suppressor genes, you now have an initiated cell. And you and me and everybody on Earth has them in our body. I have more than you do because I'm older. It turns out as long as that initiated single cell is uh, connected to and communicating with normal cells, your body cannot distinguish that initiated cell from the normal cell. If it could, our immune system would eliminate these initiated cells and nobody would get cancer and nobody would age. But because of gap junctions, these normal cells are suppressing the mutated cell uh, that's called an initiated cell. It can sit in our body our whole life. Three-fourths of us will die without being diagnosed with cancer. But one-fourth of us mm. will die having been diagnosed with cancer that may have caused our death. So what's the difference? It turns out there's at least five ways we now know block cell-cell communication, allowing this single initiated cell to grow into a benign tumor such as a papilloma on the skin, an enzyme-altered foci in the liver, a nodule in the breast, a polyp in the colon, they all were derived because that single initiated cell, either through surgery, partial irritation like uh, asbestos fiber caught in our lung, necrosis, you drink too much alcohol, you kill the normal cells, but initiated cells and stem cells are resistant to these toxic chemicals and radiation. Growth factors. This is why children will always be at risk for cancer. They can't escape their own growth factors that can block cell communication. They need these growth factors for growth and repair and therefore they're going to always be susceptible and at high risk for cancer because if they're initiated early in life, they now will develop a cancer. And finally, everybody, every second of the day, are exposed to exogenous agents that can block cell-cell communication. At the same time, we can be exposed to agents that do just the opposite, that increase cell communication. And as long as those three quarters of people who die before we get our cancer is because we have kept this blockage versus increase of communication in balance, whereas those one fourth of us who will get the cancer before they die are those who've been exposed to agents that block communication and overrun the agents that can increase communication. In other words, they change the imbalance. And then finally, one of those cells will accrue enough mutations and epigenetic changes to get the hallmarks of cancer. So, with that, the next conceptual slide that puts this together 
puts the stem cell with the initiation promotion model together. Here you have a stem cell that's going to divide asymmetrically. One daughter will be formed by the mother cell to be a stem cell, just like the mother daughter, the mother cell. The other daughter cell will go down the pathway of terminal differentiation, and they will never give rise to cancer. A, a red blood cell that doesn't have a nuclei, a lens cell of the uh, of the eye doesn't have any nuclei. It'll never become a cancer. Uh, so what you see here is a normal stem cell dividing by asymmetric cell division. Now we form a mutation in one of those 150 or so cancer-related genes. Of those cells that survive, it turns out they don't asymmetrically divide. But if they're exposed to agents that cause symmetrical cell division, these cells now will make two, four, six, eight, all of the initiated cells will form these benign tumors, one of which may now accrue additional mutations and epigenetic changes, so that becomes an invasive metastatic cell with the hallmarks of cancer. This then puts together stem cells, initiation, promotion, and progression all into one model. Do you think that the basis of that hallmarks and that model, uh, obviously additions have been added to that right. model over the years and different opinions, but in my opinion, I don't think the basics of that hallmark will ever change. I think the framework will stay the same. It's just how we interpret it and how we pull different parts out and look at it a different way. Maybe you agree, disagree, I don't know. I agree completely. Um, one other thing is that these hallmarks as depicted by Hanahan and uh, Weinberg, actually that model proves that stem cells give rise to cancer because Almost all of those hallmarks are not unique to cancer cells, but to normal cell, stem cells. In other words, those properties are properties of normal stem cells, and they are also properties of cancer stem cells. So the real question that people should be asking, besides me, because I've asked this question, then what's the <laughs> difference between a normal stem cell and a cancer stem cell? And the answer, I think, is very simple. You can just smile at a normal cancer stem cell and it differentiates. You can yell and scream at a cancer stem cell and it ain't going to respond to you. That's the difference. So what has changed? The cancer stem cell can no longer asymmetrically divide to make a differentiated cell. And my assumption, my prediction is that we're going to find that the mutated initiated cell the gene that controls the extracellular matrix in the niche of a stem cell is one that no longer sends a signal to the stem cell to differentiate. That is where people should be looking at mutations in the genes that control the extracellular matrix proteins. All right. Okay. That, it, it now is that's a hypothesis, but it's worth testing. Yeah. That's what hypothesis testing is all about. 